What's cracking, big dogs? Monday morning, which means we are diving behind the business of fantasy football. There's no player talk today. There's no player analysis. There's no there's no rookies. There's no draft analysis. There, there will be no late round quarterback talk today. We are diving behind the industry from a marketing, a social, a brand, a company perspective and everything that's going on in the industry. We'd like to bring one guest on each week that I think is doing a phenomenal job innovating, pushing the space forward, doing something unique has made it per se, for lack of a better term, and hopefully sharing their insights that will be you know, inspirational to you guys, help the people out there that are trying to break through, show you that there are many, many different types of people, all shapes and sizes coming from different angles. And if they could do it, so can you. These are all normal people. They just happen to have a little bit more of a following. And that includes today's guest, JJ Zacharyson. I will take it straight from his header. He is a dad. He is the editor in chief at both Number Fire and FanDuel, author of the Late Round Quarterback, host of the Late Round Podcast, and Live the Stream. Welcome, JJ Zacharyson, to the show. Thanks for having me, man. It's nice to two things. It's nice to have a host that pronounces my name correctly, which props props for that. It was Second 50, thing, fifty. I wasn't sure if I did it right, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, no I've one heard ever the JJ does, Zachary no and I was going to ask you pre-show, and I was like, let's just let's just let it ride. No, you crush it. You crush it. And then you know the the other thing is nice to sort of you know not go on a show and talk about fantasy, you know, specifically about about players and late round quarterback. I feel like every show I go on, it's like the default for people to just ask me about like quarterbacks and late round quarterbacks and etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's nice to not only get away from fantasy for a little bit but not specifically you know talk about the quarterback stuff yeah you know what's funny is everybody that i bring on to the show pretty much says the same sentiment at first they're all so passionate about fantasy and that's why they're here and that's why they're like they're on the show to begin with they're all like i'll tell you what really really nice not to talk about fantasy football yeah. for a change you know for sure for sure yeah, and let, let me ask you, of all those different titles that you have outside of the dad part, because I'm sure that's yeah. number one by default, what is, uh, what, what's is the thing you're most proud of, I, I would say, up to this point in your career when it comes to you know grinding through the space and, and being where you are today? Is it is it growing the number fire team? Is it being acquired by FanDuel? Is it you know just the work you put out with the, the book that you made? Like What comes to mind first when you're talking about the drive that you've had and what you've created thus far? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. That's a great question. I, I think that it's sort of been in stages for me, of course, you know, because like a lot of those things have happened at different parts of my career. You know, the book is really what launched my career and was, you know, that's that's how I got noticed at first. And then, you know, going into number fire, then getting bought by FanDuel had its own little stage in my life. And then now, you know, doing the, the podcast thing, like as I'm doing so frequently now, you know, that's sort of just been, you know, like the late round podcast has become like my baby in the space where I'm just putting so much effort into that. So like current time, it's probably that, but I don't want that to diminish, you know, the other things that I'm, I've got going on. And like, I don't want, you know, someone who's working for me, who's listening to this right now, feel like I'm, yeah. I'm giving them the shaft a little bit by not, by not calling out the editor in chief side of things. But yeah, I mean like the late round podcast has just become like, what I do in the space at this point. And it's cool and it's fun. And I, I really enjoy it. But every single one of those things, you know, that you mentioned had played an, an incredibly important role for me to be able to like get to the point of doing that podcast as a, as a big chunk of my job. Yeah. I mean, listen, that, that's your baby. So to, to be proud of that obviously makes sense. Getting to that point though, you know, I've listened to some of the interviews and podcasts you've been on where you delve into these topics at a smaller scale. Now, before you started doing the fantasy football stuff before it was actual work for you. You were in the marketing world. You went to the University of Pittsburgh, I believe. And tell us a little bit about your segue from school into marketing at the ad agency and then kind of, you know, the bridge from there to fantasy football. In high school, and I know that you were talking college there, but it's necessary to sort of preface this. But in high school, like I never did traditional jobs really i mean i had some but i usually would like quit after two weeks because i just couldn't couldn't handle like working for people and stuff and i was immature and all that kind of stuff but i i in high school i was self-taught graphic design and, and a little bit of web design and so the way i would make any money like in summers and stuff and even during the school year was i would just like find people who needed websites done and i would do them for very very cheap because i was 16 years old and back then like it wasn't like like wordpress wasn't even a thing really back then so it was more so like hard coding stuff and so there's a little bit bigger of a barrier to entry back then so that was sort of like my background going into college then and so from there you know at first i didn't know if i really wanted to do graphic design or web design or, or what have you in college i decided to go the marketing route because you know i figured i have this stuff that was already self-taught i don't know if 
you know, getting a, a degree, getting a degree, sure, it would take me down this path for my career, I'm sure. But if I, you know, understood the marketing side a little bit better, the business side a little bit better, felt like I can merge those two and, you know, be a little bit more dynamic as an employee. So, you know, I went to Pitt, got my degree there. And then soon after I graduated, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, she had a job out in Cincinnati, Ohio. And so I started looking out there and it was kind of kind of a good spot for me because Procter & Gamble's out there. And you know, I got my degree in marketing. I knew that given my background in graphic and web design, getting into the ad agency world would have been pretty cool. And the fact that P&G was there and they have all these consumer brands I would be potentially working on. I mean, there's so many ad agencies in Cincinnati and they all work for Procter & Gamble. And so I knew that if I could get into an ad agency there, then I would be working for these giant brands and that would be really cool. And that's really shiny and fun, you know, coming out of college at 22 years old. I got my degree, got a job out there and I was a project manager and that's really where things like, you know, I worked with awesome, awesome people. I, you know, that I still am in touch with a lot of them, but, you know, it was just not a very fulfilling thing for me. You know, the PM roles in the ad agency world are very much glorified admins in a way, and in a lot of places at least. And I just knew that I had more to bring, you know, like I, I had a background in being creative and like designing things and building things. But then I was trying to like merge these two worlds with my marketing degree and the, and the design background into this like project management role when realistically it almost did none of that in a way. Like I had the knowledge to be able to PM projects and like bring web developers together and get them on on track and, and allow them to understand like what the tasks are, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, I like, I felt like I was like, I want to be the person who's actually doing this stuff, right? Like, I don't want to be the person who's directing people to do this stuff because I know that I can offer up these creative ideas to do those things. And that's where at that point in time, probably like three years in my two or two to three years in my career, uh, I was like, something's got to change. I can keep going off of that, but I, I'll at least stop there because maybe it, maybe you it can, spawns. You can run mind. for as long as you want, man. We let these, we let the conversations flow. But I, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and say we kind of have a similar background story in a sense. I started out of school at a semi entry level business position, and the job I took after that was actually I took another shitty job. I had a lot of full time jobs by the time I was like 23 or 24 years old out of school. And similar yeah. to you, I just realized those were not what I was looking for. And something that I've tried to relay, especially to my younger audience is like, how do I find my passion? How do I find what I'm looking for? And my first thought is always like, don't you're, you're not going to find what you're looking for out of the gate. But as soon as you know, something's not right for you, if you hate doing something, eliminate that and don't let like the stigma of society or whatever it is dictate how long you stay somewhere that you hate. I think when you start eliminating different pieces of your path that you don't like, you'll quickly start pushing yourself in the right direction. And that's what I tried to do. You know, that landed me in a marketing agency. And similar to you, it was still like a very entry level position where I was just starting to learn about like media buying and things like that. Yeah. Um, as the as the landscape kind of progressed, the company I was working at got bought out and they had like a new agency kind of come in and they were like, oh, we're going to flip roles and whatever. And I started doing social buying. Like this is when Facebook really started becoming like the advertising platform. And I was like, yeah. this is some shit I can get behind, you know, because I'm growing up in the social media world. Companies are starting to see that this is wildly important. I'm like, OK, this is where like the creativity starts to meet what we're doing from like an admin level. And that's why I'm so right. passionate about the marketing side of things, because I was fortunate enough to be in a place where like I was allowed to use my creativity at, at a little bit of a, a younger age. And I started moving around a few different marketing agencies before I knew it, like I was working on all my own fantasy shit. And I was like, I know what I want to build for myself. But I think mm -hmm. there's a common denominator here within a lot of people in the space that have, you know, made it or have been successful, or at least are you're, you're able to see that they're going to grow, right? Because they look at it from a different landscape. And the, the common theme I'm seeing is a lot of people have these backgrounds within marketing branding, software, technology. You know, you talk about the fantasy footballers, you look at Matt Kelly over at Roto Underworld. Yes, a lot of people have made it just through pure passion, but that's difficult in today's world without actually having a more general sense of like how to scale these things, how to look at it right. from a different industry or an angle. So I'm interested on, on your take on, you know, these successful businesses that have these other backgrounds that kind of push their company or brand forward. And like what kind of commonalities do you see within a lot of people just in general, maybe it doesn't have to be the company or the brand, but like maybe it's personality traits, maybe it's, you know, whatever it is that you see within people that have kind of made it or been successful within the space. 
Yeah, that's a great question. I feel like I'm going to say that every time you ask a question, but I'll take the, it every time. <laughs> the, the the thing that that I cuz like not only is it on the company end like you said, but you know, having worked as the editor in chief now for a while at First, a startup, now a, a multi, multi, multi billion dollar company. <laughs> Keep it um, I see, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I've seen, I've seen a lot of people because I've recruited a lot of people. I've read through thousands and thousands of of samples before, right? And so, like at the individual level, there's a very, very clear difference, in my opinion, of the t- the kind of person that then goes on to you know, have a full-time job. Let's just define that as making it, if you will. You know, there's guys that have con- come through like the number fire funnel, if you will, you know, like a uh, Chris Raybon wrote for, for number fire. That's how he started or Scott Barrett, Graham Barfield. I mean, there's guys that, that really started doing what they're doing at number fire. And, you know, I look back at those people and, you know, I realize that of course, like the typical stuff was there, the work ethic was there, the passion was there, all of that. But you know, I think that the one thing that's really key for anything content related, and this goes across being related to the individual all the way to the brand, all the way to what the product is, people do not understand differentiation at all. One of the things that that I think is very helpful, of course, is to walk through people's journeys and people give advice based on their journey. And I think that you you can, you know, like Matthew Berry does it all the time. And it's very helpful for people to see, you know, what he did to get where he's at. Now, there's not going to be another Matthew Barry again in the fantasy football industry. That's just not going to happen. That's not how this works. But at the same time, you know, you can take little pieces of his journey, sure, and use that and, and see, you know, whatever you can glean from it and and go go from there. But in my opinion, if you're just replicating what someone else has already done, you're not going to really go anywhere, right? So you need to take these little factoids and these things. That, and I've, I've tweeted threads out before about just like, what I look for when I'm recruiting people and stuff. But it's really important to not just go down this very consistent path that so many have already gone down because you're not doing anything different then. I tell people all the time too, is that like if someone sends me a a writing sample and it's just like rankings or something, I, I don't care because no one, this is just facts. No one knows who you are. And so no one cares about your rankings, right? Like just, it doesn't matter. You need to have some sort of substance behind what you're doing before you can get to that point. I mean, people care about Evan Silva's rankings now, but when Evan Silva had a hundred Twitter followers and didn't, you know, people weren't reading and listening to his stuff, didn't matter back then, right? So that's one thing is is the differentiation side. But then, you know, on top of that, I think that the people who have done best are the people who know how to double down on what they're good at and they are self-aware as to what they're, they're good at doing. I mean, there's a lot of people who will again, this is more on like the personal level, but I think that personal brand, you know, builds into the larger company for, for a lot of these places. I mean, whether you're talking footballers, whether you're talking to you guys, what have you. And so I, I think that like, if you're self-aware of what you're good at, what you're not good at, it's just insanely important. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. When I go and recruit people to write for number fire and FanDuel, I'm finding people who are doing things that I'm incapable of doing and I'm not good at. And I think that having that self-awareness is just incredibly important. And so often you look across the landscape, you see people getting upset. They don't have full-time, full-time jobs in the industry and they're just bitching about this stuff. Sorry. I don't know if I can, if I can, I'm assuming I can swear on this. Because the more, the, more, seen, the, better. the more, the better. I, I know. I'm like, I've seen, I've Fuck seen your it. channel. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, you see people bitching about like not getting this full-time gig in the industry and they're working so hard and they're doing this and that, but they're not really like looking at, they're not really oftentimes not really trying to get better and looking at their deficiencies and finding ways to make up for that in, in other areas. And there's just there's just more to it than sending tweets and hopping on a Google Hangout. Like there's just there's just more to it than that. So I think this, you know, to to answer your question more directly, I think differentiation is really, really key. And then the self-awareness piece is really, really key. And just being humble about that and understanding that like you don't know everything about a certain topic. You don't know everything about whether it's fantasy football analysis, whether it's the growth of your business, whatever it is, you don't know everything about that. And so find people and surround yourself with people who can fill those gaps. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so much to unpack there. I think at the end, what you said was interesting. There's, there are so many people on Twitter that kind of get frustrated by the fact that, you know, they're not full-time in the space and listen, it's, it's nobody else's fault that, that you're not full-time. You're just not the correct value add for whatever a place is looking for in a full-time employee. And a lot of them are, you know, going on and blogging and writing. And it's like, listen, that only pushes the needle so, so far. And it goes back to self-awareness. I think it's, it's an interesting space because you have like brands building themselves up, which have 
a really a really big ceiling from a like a personality perspective. And you have individual content creators, and you know it's it's this like dichotomy of what you want to do, and based on like what you want to do, you kind of have to reverse engineer the content that you're putting out. And we have a lot of like young kids that ask me like, you know, how do I start working for you? Or like, if I'm a communications major, what would be like the next step for you to do this? And I'm just like, in today's world, especially in an industry where one, it's obviously super saturated, but two, it's like you have to be really creative to stand out. It's not about being like just straight up the smartest on paper. It's you kind of have to create your own job, right? It's not like someone is out there basically offering you the role. Yeah. Every once in a while, FanDuel will be like, we're opening up a full time position. They're going to get 5000 applicants there. Like the way to stand out is right. by doing that. You're like it, you have to work on the job you want prior to it being offered to you. Like you have to create that because when the fan duel looks at 5,000 applicants, who are they going to look at the kid from Harvard? Who's a communications major or, or the kid who built up a 25,000 person Twitter following, like it's going to be right. the kid who's already shown you that he could provide value to the audience. And I think, you know, a lot of people have this preconcept notion of like, Oh, if I do what Matthew Berry was doing, then I'm going to get hired for the job Matthew Berry was doing. But like we live in such a, a crazy landscape that shit is changing you i really believe that you have to create your own job at this point and if you haven't built up such a platform and a, a foundation for who you are from a personal level it's going to be more and more and more and more difficult to to really make that happen yeah yeah and i think that the only way to really grasp what it takes then to think differently and to sort of flip that switch you know, it's very helpful to read again to, to read the journeys of matthew barry and to see what he did to get where he's at but you know it's in not order practically to, if, it's not practically helpful it's it's like inspirationally helpful knowing that like he started from nothing but nothing he says yeah. to you and no knock on him obviously most of the shit that i say probably won't be practical for most people but like yeah 100 percent, it's crazy and i think like you know differentiating yourself too on that point i think a lot of people look at this in a very like two top level view there's so many ways to differentiate and i think people like oh, I need to come up with this new statistic or piece of analysis that differentiates me. It's it, There's so many different levels to this yes. shit. Like, you know, it's it's finding the niches within the niches of things that can differentiate you. Like being on TikTok first can differentiate you. Being someone who's a great writer, you're not going to break out from blogging. But like there was a time where you could break out on Instagram because people loved the long captions of those things. Like those are the types of things I'm looking for when I'm talking about like niching down and expanding yourself through differentiation. Yes, and a good example of that is is cuz I again, I I go from that lens with literally everything that I do. A every piece of content that I do, I think to myself, why would someone want to consume this as opposed to consuming in this insanely saturated market, right? And so, from my perspective, like a good example I think of what at least how I've tried to use it is with the late round podcast. And I I say that because I don't think that the, you know, if I were to start another hour long podcast, like everyone else in the industry has, uh, you know, I don't know if it would have gotten to the point that it's gotten to today from a downloads numbers perspective and all that kind of stuff. Because what I try to do is look at it from the perspective of, okay, how can I really differentiate this show? I'm going to start a new show. It's going to be a solo show. How, what can I do to make this stand out? And I realized that there's nothing, there was nothing in the fantasy space that really gave you a TED Talk-esque angle to fantasy football. And so instead of differentiating more on the content end, and by the content end, I mean, you know, doing a certain study that no one's done before, I'm differentiating instead via shortening this podcast. Instead of doing it an hour, it's 15 to 20 minutes each show. It's really digestible that people can just listen to really quickly in their car. And that's it. That's all you need. That's all you need to do. It's something that simple. Now, hopefully the content itself is good. I hope, you know, I hope I'm not shitting the bed with the content that I'm putting out there. But regardless, you know, like it's it's just those small tweaks really can go a long way in growing whatever you're trying to grow. Yeah, I mean, there's so many tweaks. It could be a timing thing. It could be a scheduling thing. It could be a fucking personality appearance. Like there's just so many different angles with it. Find what's most natural to you figure out why that's your twist and then hit it. And of course the, the under, yeah. uh, underlying denominator always has to be good, good content that will play itself out over the long run. So you, you transitioned from an ad agency and you started working for number fire and you were like the first person on their, their team to start building up the team. Correct. And this was while you were still in the marketing field. 
Yeah. So basically what happened was when I was like not feeling, feeling it much with my gig in the ad agency world, I, I did what a lot of people in their early twenties who don't really, you know, you, I, I took a step back and I'm like, do I really want to do this shit for the rest of my life? Like, is this really what I, I'm going to be doing? And so I, I realized I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. So I really just opened up a word document one day. I remember it pretty vividly. I opened up a Word document. I just started throwing ideas of like what my passions were into this document. Had some stuff listed in there. You know, I've always been like this fantasy football, taking it too seriously guy in my league. And so I was like, well, let, let me like investigate this space a little bit. You know, I was a uh, someone who like would consume fantasy content and stuff, but not to like an insane degree. But I also just knew that, you know, I was just really into to fantasy. I had commissioned my leagues for like seven or eight years at that point, nine years. And I just knew that I really liked it. And then at the time, after researching like what was going on in the content space there, I realized that, you know, the people were the, the big theme. This is back in 2011 to 2012. The big theme back then was drafting quarterbacks early in your fantasy draft. And so I looked at that and I'm like, this doesn't make any sense logically, right? Like my brain just started going and going and going. And I'm like, I've been drafting quarterbacks late my entire fantasy football life. And there's reasons for it. Clearly, I just never ever really like put it all to, to paper. And so from there, what I did for the next year, eight months, let's say, I would work during the day and then I'd go home and I would just work on this, what ended up being the late round quarterback ebook. And it was not you know, at first I didn't know what I was really writing for. I was just sort of like finding that outlet in a way I and mean, just trying to like do something different to sort of get my creative juices flowing. But I sort of realized at the time, and this is again, this is back in like 2011 before like eBooks were everywhere they are today. And like, you know, you could make a PDF and like there's converters and stuff that'll just yeah. throw it into any, any store you want. Back then you had to like code it if you wanted to be responsive on, on different like devices and stuff. So I was actually like, meshing all of my like my entire background together into this late round quarterback ebook because I was putting design elements in there and I was like creating the logo for it and stuff. I was coding it on the front end from a front end perspective and doing some like CSS and stuff like that. And then I was able and then obviously the marketing to get it out there. But then I was also getting my creative juices flowing a little bit because I was looking at data, which I had always been very good at math and stuff. But I was looking at data and I was writing and I was putting get, getting the creative side that I hadn't really tapped into since I had started my job after after graduating college. So I sort of just brought everything together and I created this late round quarterback ebook that I then launched in June of 2012. So, you know, just think of the typical fantasy season that was like a little bit before people really get into into drafting for redraft purposes. And then from there, you know, that was a season where like I think it was Andrew Luck's rookie year and like these like RG3 had a good, so all these late round quarterbacks like hit, right? Mm -hmm. But I knew also that it wasn't, I, I didn't need just like that luck for the strategy to play out because I knew that it was a strategy that just was like logical and just inherently made sense. So the 2012 season was like really good from a late round quarterback standpoint. And everyone's like, oh, but the person who wrote about late round quarterbacks was this guy at late round QB and I'm getting tagged all the time and stuff. And that starts building me up a little bit on Twitter where everyone was at. And then at the end of the 2012 season, Evan Silva hit me up from Roto World when he was at Roto World. And that was like a, you know, that's like a surreal moment where you're just like, like this dude that you've been reading and that you've seen, you know, communicating on Twitter and stuff, massive following hits you up. And he's like, Hey, you want to, you want to do a quarterback series on Roto World? And so I wrote a quarterback series that was basically a way for me to pimp the uh, late round quarterback ebook a little bit while also just taking ideas from it that I had already written. So it didn't really take that much effort. So I did that quarterback series that got some, me some more notice. And then uh, I wrote like I, I PFF came calling. So Mike Clay, when he was at PFF, he hit me up. I did like three articles for PFF. And then all the while, while this was going on, I was always blogging. I blogged at least once a day over on lateroundqb.com. And so I was doing that and I brought on like a team of just dudes who wanted to, to write, write fantasy content. And so I was managing this like team of, of four guys uh, who I'm, st I mean, some of them actually have still work at, at number fire and FanDuel with me, which is dope. But I had this team of like four guys where we were just writing content, whatever we wanted to write, we were throwing it out there. And so I think that was what was attractive when Numberfire called then about a year after I published my ebook, Numberfire called. I had a connection to Nick Bonadio, who was the Numberfire CEO. He's the one who found it all. He graduated from the same high school as me seven years before I did. And he had just happened to start 
a fantasy football slash fantasy and sports betting website. And so he knew that I was like doing some stuff in the space, called me up, asked me if I wanted to run content. And I jumped on it because I ended up getting a full-time job in the industry after, you know, publishing the ebook for a year. So when he brought you on to run the, the content full-time, uh, that, that was actually like a full-time role? Yeah. So that was also a little awkward too, because I, I'm st I still feel this way, but I, I know that like full-time jobs in this space, they're not easy to come by. And I knew that back then, and I was just ready to do whatever I had to do to get a full-time gig doing what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so it was cool though, because the, the first job, so I had two ad agency jobs. The first one was great. Loved the people I worked with, but then some of the people went to another agency and I moved with them. And, and it was the, the second one that I was with was a really small communications marketing agency. And the owner of it was so supportive because it was like during the time that I was writing my ebook and she was so supportive of what I was doing. It like, I was there for like a year, year and a half. How, how old were you at this time? 23, 24, 24, probably. Yeah. She was just so, so helpful. Like she, again, she runs this PR firm. And when my ebook went out, she like was running, was like doing advertising for it and stuff, like helping me out, like legit. Like it was just such a good relationship. And, you know, I was doing good work for the company, of course, but it was just like very, very cool to have that kind of support. So, you know, it was actually in a way like tough for me to call her up and be like, yo, I actually got a job doing this now. You know, I think like, cause you helped me so much throughout that, throughout all that. Uh, like she put a press release out and stuff whenever my <laughs> ebook went out, like it was crazy. And so you give her, um, a, uh, you give her an affiliate code. Yeah. I mean, seriously, it's <laughs> like, it's like, like I, I look back and I, I think that that situation, like be, I understand how fortunate I was to be in situations that allowed me to do that kind of stuff. Like there, like if I got my work done at work and it was good work, then I could work on the fantasy stuff at work and it didn't matter, like openly, right? Like they they didn't, she didn't care because I was, was getting just, my work she done. She was just 10 years ahead of her time. Like that's how it is that's right, exactly. in, in today's world, yeah. You know, it's funny the, where I said, I'm, I'm actually surprised that you're underneath somebody in, in terms of like in, as an employee because I too started to learn all these things when I started doing the YouTube and the content stuff like learning how to make websites and learning how to design things and learning all the ins and outs of being someone who was going to spend the rest of his life doing things online and in technology and whatever and I got to the mm -hmm. point where I was like I need to know video editing I need to know all of this shit because I don't ever want to run something where like I'm asking someone to do something that I don't know how to do. It makes me uncomfortable. And I feel like that's a trait of maybe not like an entrepreneurial trait, but it feels like you have a lot of those entrepreneurial things. Like you're building something, you're starting to take on team members, you're doing all this stuff. And then you kind of end up being not a piece in the cog, but like you are working under somebody rather than continuing to build up your own thing. So I guess my question is like, when you're transitioning over from the ad agency to this bigger company, are you comfortable doing that? Because you know, your background experience will allow you to have a bigger say in the creative process. Like what do you bring over from your experience, like in the marketing world or your experience building up content by yourself into a company like FanDuel? Yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of it is like more so what I, what I didn't like, you know, and what I, what I didn't want to do where, you know, when I was working in the ad agency world, I just hated, despised how slow and unnecessarily slow things were, right? Yeah. Like it's a fast paced environment, but I think it's more of a fast paced environment for people that are making key decisions and the people that are making key decisions, if you just think of like a, I mean, like the, the ad agencies, the first one that I worked for too, especially, I mean, it's a fairly large one, all things considered, because you can find smaller shops, you know, that, that are doing, you know, just a few projects at a time. But this one was like 80 plus employees. So it was like yeah. a big, you know, it was more of like a structure to it. And so, you know, at that time, the decision making was most definitely on the shoulders of people who were just naturally higher up in the company. The cool thing was, was that all of those people were incredibly accessible and like really great people. So it has nothing to do with them. It's just the way that like, when you get bigger, that's just how things work, right? Is that when, when you're that large, you know, the people down low, and I was in an entry level position, but the people down low are not making those decisions. And so as a result of that, you know, when, when you're waiting for approval for things constantly, not even like legal approval with stuff, I'm talking like approval from, from the superiors. Right. Yeah. And when you're like waiting for that kind of stuff, it, it really halts the creative process and it halts 
like anything that you're really generating. Cause I know that you know this, but like anyone who is creating content or is building something, you know, you get these like spurts, these like moments of like, you know, being in a flow state. Right. And like, you just go nuts and imagine being in that state, but you're not able to actually work on anything because it's being, you know, held up by this random creative director who has all these other projects that they're working on. Yeah. And so from my perspective, you know, moving from, from that, and I, I wanted to instill the opposite in what I did at, at number fire. And then obviously now FanDuel, but you know, it was easier at number fire because we were a startup. You know, I was, I think employee six at number fire. We ended up before we got bought, we had like 15, I want to say employees, maybe not even, but like, you know, you go from an environment where, or I went from an environment and it was, there was a learning curve for sure, because I went from a place where, yes, I was making some decisions because I went to a, a slightly smaller ad, age, ad agency before this number fire gig. But like, I went from a place where I wasn't making these like really tough decisions to all of a sudden being thrown in the fire and, you know, having really no idea like what startup life is like. And now all of a sudden having to like legitimately make decisions because I am now running point on content, on, on content, right? And like, I have no idea really what I'm doing. A lot of just like, guessing and, and make, you know, seeing I'm trying to be as logical as I can, but that to me was a really good experience. Even if I sucked at it at times, because I learn a lot better by just being thrown in and just doing it, which goes all the way back to like, you know, my high school days, you know, when I was talking about like being self-taught with graphic and web design and stuff, I could never sit through classes and learn that I have to just do it. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I went to number fire, uh, I, I think that, that what I took from from my old experience was basically more so what not to do than what to do and focus on. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because everything you said just just like hit spot on there. And I've talked about this on my channel many times to, to anyone who listens to me about anything like marketing related is that some of the agencies I've been on, I've, I've worked in an agency with 25 people, which is really fun. It's high pace and it's energetic yeah. and you know, you can actually make an impact the next agency I worked at was over 200 people where I right. was not entry level, but like I might as well have been because anytime you wanted to make an impact, it was go through the manager who's got to get a sign off from their manager who's got to get a sign off from their job. And I see that in the fantasy space pretty often because a lot of the players who were big that were starting to see, you know, get knocked down by the companies like Sleeper, who I had the CEO on a couple of weeks ago, those companies are innovating way quicker. And I think yeah. it's an issue for a lot of brands and companies within our space. They have the same mentality of, because they are big companies, obviously, and fantasies is just a small portion of what they actually do, but that will play itself out, I think. So I've, I've been there, can, can completely like empathize with the way you're feeling on that thing, because that's a very, very real problem. And I guess my follow-up question is like, now at FanDuel, is that not the same? Yeah, I mean, it is, because it has to be, right? It's impossible yeah. for it not to be. That's not a knock on FanDuel at all. I, I think that in comparison to other big, I mean, FanDuel's massive now. And in comparison to other companies of its size, things move faster. So from that perspective, you know, it's it's good and it's fast. But I would say that, you know, the good part about me and the way that I work and the way that I want to work is that we're very, my team and I are, are pretty separate from the usual things that are going on at FanDuel. And we have an insane amount of control over what we do and what we publish and what we're what we're creating day to day. So, you know, it's not as much of a problem for me. Like anything that I that I do with my podcast, it's it's on me. And then there's, you know, it's it's more of the bigger picture stuff that, you know, the the direction that we go in or like the things that we want to change that are larger that would then be sluggish, right? Like if we like I'll hear about something you know, eight months ago that is now happening today, right? Whereas if I were the one doing it, you know, fewer people doing something, you're gonna be able to get it done a little bit faster when it comes to some of the, you know, just regular business dealings and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, like, it's definitely an issue. It's definitely a thing. I shouldn't say issue. It's definitely more of a thing. But I think the difference between where I was at when it was a thing for me, you know, when I was 24 years old versus now is that now I have more of that decision-making ability and so I get more out of it. And then also on top of that, like we're very seg like segregated from the rest of the company in a way, just given our function and what we do. And, you know, we still communicate across categories and whatnot, and we, we still communicate across teams, but you know, the content team in general, we're just sort of a well-oiled machine and we're just doing what we want to do. And, and it's mutually beneficial for us and the company. 
Yeah, so I guess on that point, like I'm, I'm curious about the the inner workings at FanDuel when it comes to the content and like your guys' involvement. You say you're you're pretty separated, and we'll just kind of jump to one of the Q and Assault questions from my man Sal V, friend of the show. He said, "What was JJ's involvement with creating the in-house FanDuel podcast network? Assume we see more gaming sites begin to go this route, and you know, you said you're kind of separate from what they're doing, and like FanDuel is obviously massive, and they're covering a zillion different sports, and they got a zillion different things going on." Where would you say like the fantasy content sits in terms of like the totem pole there? And do you guys have like ultimate content meetings and stuff where do they push a direction that you have to go in or is everything you do really kind of on your shoulders? You choose the direction of the actual content. Yeah, so there's a lot of layers to it. You know, I, I first off the the FanDuel Podcast Network, I I was the brainchild of it. It started out as the Number Fire Podcast Network when the Late Round Podcast launched, like almost four years ago, I think it is now, maybe three. That's when the whole podcast network launched, and we started doing DFS shows. We have a sports betting show now too, and then the Late Round Podcast. And so we basically wanted to bring forth, and this is more of a content strategy thing that that I can get into as well. But we wanted to bring forth a, a variety of shows that would cover everyone or a large number of people in in like a marketing funnel, right? Top of funnel being a very casual player, bottom being someone who's about to convert and be a, a degenerate sports better. You know, you want to cover that that whole spectrum. You know, I don't think we do, we're not, what we're producing. So let me take a step back. So what we produce at FanDuel is, let's just call it custom content, right? So it's content that we're building in-house. Um, and so we're doing fantasy stuff. We're doing sports betting stuff, both DFS and season long. Some people will say, well, why is FanDuel and a, a company owned by FanDuel and Numberfire making season long fantasy content? I mean, the stuff that I focus on is still season long. And the, the reason for that is we know that the demographic is fairly similar, right? We know that the, the customer that's playing that, that, that we want to convert to be sports bettors and, and DFS players, they're going to come from the, the season long demographic. That's just how it works, right? And so since we know that, then if we can capture those people in the late round podcast, let's say, and we capture these people who we know in the late round podcast are going to be a little bit more hardcore than what you're going to get from like the fantasy footballers. Mm -hmm. So and that's nothing against, I mean, they, they're obviously crushing it. I know they wouldn't take that offense to that, but it's just that, that my delivery slash the stuff that I'm covering is just different than what they're covering. Right. And so I know that the people listening to my show are going to probably be a little bit more into a season long fantasy football, whereas they're getting the cat more, they're going to have more casuals in their audience. And so the, the nice part from my perspective is that means that they're further down this marketing funnel, that they're closer to convert, right? They're closer to actually being, you know, hearing an ad on the show and being like, well, maybe I should go play over on, on Fandle and, and take advantage of this offer. Or maybe I should go, you know, I live in one of the states where sports betting is legal. Maybe I should go to the sports book this weekend, what have you. So the way that we, for, the way that we create content is we think about that funnel Top of funnel being this casual player, bottom of funnel being the the, dege the degenerate that's about to convert. I shouldn't say degenerate when I'm oh, talking I'm, about our, I'm our, actually our like audience. I'm interested. But... Do, do, do the top level executives like are those are those boardroom terminologies? <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. That's just me. That's just my I, easy. I, I don't. Way. I don't believe you, but okay. <laughs> not at all. No, no. It's it's more so. It's it's you know we're we're if you think of it as the hardcore gamer, right? Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get the hardcore gamer to play more. Uh, of course, it's a business, right? We're trying to entertain them though throughout the way. And so there's an entertainment component and there's a conversion component. And so if you think of what we do at the company, so far, the content team has been much more focused on like middle of funnel and bottom of funnel content. So if you go to number fire, that's more bottom of funnel because you're giving very direct advice. It's going to be numbers driven that's going to be a segment of people that would actually give a shit about that, right? As opposed to someone who's just, you know, on Twitter and sees an article or on some sort of social media platform, like, or maybe on TikTok, and they see something that's more, you're just trying to grow that relationship with them as the casual player and the casual sports fan. And that's where, you know, what we've done strategically, what my boss has done really a really good job of is finding partners out there that are not necessarily part of our full-time content team, but we're signing to deals and becoming partners with and affiliates with. So great example of that is Pat McAfee. So Pat McAfee is part of the FanDuel family right now, but he's the perfect like top of funnel personality mm -hmm. slash show. So we're sort of bring you know, we're gathering and, and building that audience all while still having the bottom of funnel stuff where it's going to be a little bit more specific. And, and that's really how we're 
we're growing and building our content. So when I say that we're separate from the rest of the company, we are only from the standpoint of like what we're creating and what we're we're doing day to day, but everything that we're doing is still strategic at at the top end, right? It's it's being funneled down to my to to from me to my team, but you know, we're not necessarily having to like you know, if we want to write an article, we can just write the damn article. Like we don't have to like go through any sort of approval process to do that, which is the, the great part of the freedom side that we were just talking about. But hopefully that jumble makes some sense because I know yeah, it's kind of It, kind it of does. And it's cool to see that side because I think most people that know you through your content know you for your content. They're like, yeah, JJ's a, a podcaster. He's a blogger. You see editor in chief at FanDuel. And I don't think most people expect you to have this you know, strong hand in how the content and stuff plays out and managing all these pieces and these different swirling parts of it to make it come together and go anywhere from the top of the funnel down to the bottom of the funnel. And just that, in a sense, lets people know or lets me know that, like, you know, you are looking at the bigger picture when it comes to all this stuff, because I'm sure, you know, you're managing a lot of people. So I do want to ask you about that as someone who started doing that as uh, at Number Fire and then is obviously doing that with a bigger team at FanDuel now. How do you separate yourself from being a content creator and then also managing other content creators. Cause this has been sort of a difficult transition for me as we're starting to like grow the team a little bit. And there will always be a part of me that understands that my content comes first and the rest of the stuff is, is like secondary, but there will come a point where you can't put as much energy and focus into that if you're trying to grow yeah. other people, you know? So like, Where's the line there? Like, what have your experiences been with managing people versus creating your own individual personal brand and content and any, any like advice in that front? Yeah, man, you got to let it go. That That's the bottom line. Like you, you have to, you hate to like, hear it. I know it sucks. Cause we're both, I mean, I can, I mean, I know that we're both the kind of people that just want to like do it, do everything for whatever we're working on. But the truth of the matter is I, it's, it's a good position that you're in because that means there's growth, right? And so my big thing was having the realization that I needed someone to manage the day-to-day -day operations of what we're doing specifically at Numberfire. So we have like other content platforms, like we have the Duel, which is not a separate content platform that I don't touch, but, and it's more so just like, and we can get into this too, but you know, content has its each individual goal, right? There, there's some goal for whatever content website you're creating or whatever piece of content you're creating. You should have a goal at least. And so, you know, the goal at number fire is definitely more stickiness at this point and trying to just enhance the relationships with the people that are playing DFS and, and sports betting. Whereas a place like the duel is more for that top of funnel, getting them aware and making them brand aware more than anything else and getting clicks and stuff. But the one thing, you know, to the management question, the one thing that I realized was that, you know, we were growing and growing and growing. And I knew, you know, you yourself have to figure out what you're trying to do. Right. And for me, I had the realization that I like, I, I love the guys that work for me. Don't get me wrong, but I know that I would rather build a listenership and readership and go the route of being a talent, if you will, if you want to categorize it that way, then, you know, climb the, the corporate ladder and be a manager. Um, can I do both? Am I capable of doing both? I think so. Like, I think that if I went hardcore manager route, then I, I could crush that. Right. Uh, but I made the decision, a conscious decision of, you know, wanting to focus on the content that I'm creating myself while still giving strategic input to what we're doing on the content side. And what that meant was letting go of the day-to-day -day stuff. I no longer am doing recruitment stuff. I no longer am managing our team of editors. I have our managing editor, Brandon Gadula, who is my, who is like, I would, would get, would give him my life at this point who crushes it. And he does, you know, he does consumer facing stuff as well, but it's just one of those things where it's just like, you gotta, you gotta really know what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish individually. And if that individual accomplishment, like for you is to really grow your brand and your, like not your individual brand, but your company brand, that's, that's great. And, and by doing that, you probably are going to lean more on managing these guys and not necessarily, but there is a payoff. There's always a payoff because time, there's just so much time, right? And so at some point you got to be like, okay, well, I can either spend my time building this person up and helping them out and doing X, Y, and Z, which I would love to do. I would love to do that. But I also have to be cognizant of what my goals are. And my goals are to build my audience, have a massive audience that not only helps me, but helps the company. 
And the way to do that is to spend more time on that, which some people might have noticed like two years ago, the late round podcast, I went from three episodes a week to four. And the reason for that was because I let some of that go. That was the turning point for me to then be able to produce more content and, and you know, really fill the gap with someone who, I mean, Brandon, Brandon's better than me at being managing editor anyway, right? And like, you start to realize that too, is that like, you know, it's a self-awareness side, sure, but it's also the, like, your business is going to be way more efficient when you're able to do something like that. Yeah, it, it, it's, I've always like had pride in myself in terms of being self-aware and like understanding what I need. I'm just in like a, a very weird spot where like I know I'm going to have to make decisions like that very soon that are very impactful for our brand that will kind of shape how it goes forward for the next like few years, I would say. And I'm just like having trouble deciding what I want. And it's kind of like the first time that I've gone through this thought process and been like, uh, you know, it's always like I've always had good intent towards it. I'm always like looking long term. I'm like, if I work hard, have good intent, it'll work itself out no matter what decision I make. I'm at the point where like, okay, I have a couple of big decisions I make. If I get it wrong, it's going to set us back or it's going to fuck something up or like X, Y, Z. So the, the, th the thing is though, is that I don't think it has to be a, a, a black and white thing, right? Like even Brandon who manages our editing team and does amazing stuff on a day-to-day -day basis for our team, he's still creating content and he's still, you know, doing podcasts and stuff like that. He's just not doing it to the same, at the same level as like I am or Jim Sonis who works for me, another guy who, who basically strictly is, is doing content creation. Like there's a gray area in there, but I do think that like goal setting and like having that five-year look as to like where you would want to be, you know, you just gradually would, would get there. So if you're saying to yourself, Hey, I want to just be a, a talent. You know, I want to grow audience that way and help my help my individual brand slash, which will then help my greater the, the greater brand. Then you make that decision, but you don't have to flip the switch tomorrow and just like go for it. You know what I mean? It can be like a a slow build to eventually get there. And as you're doing that, you're getting more and more comfortable. You're getting the right people in the right places and all of that. It's it's sim. I mean, it's it's all just like an evolution. But I do think that like the goal setting piece is insanely important because you know throughout my career of of doing content i've always been frustrated when i ask someone and say what's the goal of what we're trying to, to accomplish here like why are we doing x y and z and they'll say like are we trying to get page views or are we trying to get time on site to to go up are we trying to because like any any sort of metric that you're trying to hit changes your strat your content strategy dramatically right and I hate the answer of, oh, we just want it all because that's an impossible thing to accomplish, number one. But number two, it doesn't actually get your team on task to do what you're trying to do. So in your case, right, like you need to say to yourself, like, like, OK, I'm trying to to grow me. I know that I'm trying to grow me. And don't think of it as being selfish because you're helping your brand. You're the overall brand in the company. Right. And so, and if that's communicated properly, people understand it, they get it. And then you can slowly but surely build your way up to putting the right people in the right place. But having that goal, I think is important as opposed to, because you're getting to the point where you're like, can't do all this. I can't just say, oh, I want it all because it's impossible for one person to be able to do that. Yeah, so so more tangible goal setting. It's probably, that's actually something I've been told like, a lot, a lot recently. So it probably makes sense that yeah. everyone keeps fucking yelling at it. Even me. if it's even if, even if it's in the back of your head, because like I'm not someone who like I, I don't have a to do list. I don't do that. Like I don't. I, I'm not like a. I need to put it on a whiteboard of what my yeah. Like like I don't. You're I don't at do my that. whiteboard to do list right there. Right, <laughs> right. I don't do that, but I I know subconsciously what I'm striving for. So as long as you can like have that in mind, that's what's important. You know, you don't necessarily have to be like you know going to like seminars and shit to figure out what the, the goals are and whatnot. Yeah, I feel you. I, I, I had a, a question just to circle back on just the overall content strategy at FanDuel. You know, you guys are in, it's just like a very public, I don't want to say war, but like it's FanDuel, it's DraftKings. Do you guys have conversations about like what they're doing and competing with specific like segments or types of content they're doing or, or is it just completely in-house? What feels right to you guys? What you think will help you grow? Or because this is such a, a known thing of, you know, the two companies or whatever, like, how do you approach that competitiveness between this, the two of them? Yeah. I mean, you have to, right. <clears throat> I mean, it's like, if you're, if you're an NFL team and you see what the Ravens are doing with Lamar Jackson, 
then you have to start thinking, well, what if we could do something like that with a mobile quarterback? And you could, and, couldn't couldn't go one hour without the Lamar Jackson <clears throat> drop, huh? Yeah, of, of course, of course, of course. I, I would say, though, that the good part about what I do is that I can ignore that. So my job on the strategy side, because again, my job at this point is I'm creating the podcast, I'm doing articles and stuff, but I'm also in my boss's ear from a strategic standpoint and like what we should do, what makes sense, what we can do and what's possible. And so the nice part is he's coming to me with what DraftKings is doing. So yes, to answer your question, yes, of course. Like we're looking at what DraftKings is doing all the time. But from my perspective, as someone who is getting his team ready to make this content, uh, I don't have to say we're doing this because DraftKings is doing this and we're competing with them. I'm coming at it from the angle of like, I just want to do good shit and I want to do smart shit. So yes, you know, my boss is telling me that you know, DK is doing this and, you know, maybe we should think about doing something that way. My brain goes to let's either do something different and better than the way that they're doing it. I, 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 again, it goes sort of back to what we talked about at the beginning of like the career path stuff. Like I'm very much not a believer that you just look at what your competitors are doing and you just replicate it. There's no, all you're doing is like, here's your competitors. Okay. Now we're here, but then your competitors are just up here again. Right. Cause they're just going to keep going. You got to jump them and you got to mm -hmm. figure out ways to do things better than they're doing it. And that's really what my job is more so. So, you know, the marketing team that we have is great that I work with directly, the content marketing team, and they'll come forth with, you know, this is what's happening in the landscape. And then I help them, you know, figure out ways that we could potentially do it better. Yeah. So how do you, how do you guys allocate, like, obviously the landscape is shifting dramatically, like videos becoming a, a really massive piece of the content creation game how, how do you personally allocate like okay you know i have person x i got person y like this person's gonna put out five blog posts a week this person is gonna do three videos a week like what's your I, I, you know we don't have to get into like real specifics on anything but like overall mindset in terms of how you allocate time energy of people to the specific types of content yeah i mean it depends on the impact of the content that you're that you're creating like how, how so a good example I, i'm sure we'll talk about clubhouse in a second but like clubhouse is something that like or let's not i won't go to the clubhouse route because i know that we'll probably talk about it separately but a, a good example might be like a video platform that we're like testing right okay. and so should we be should should we put someone on that video platform when we know 13 people are going to view it who is one of our star, our studs that you know has done this for a while has a ton of experience and is higher up in the company or should we test this with someone who is more entry level and obviously the answer is let's get them more experience by throwing them on a platform where there might not be as much visibility for them and they're gaining confidence that way and all of that because i mean everyone has to start somewhere with this kind of stuff and i think that any any person who's, who's a talent is aware of that to some degree and then it, it also comes down to like what people are good at doing. You know, we have relationships with, you know, a lot of the, the leagues. And so there's like opportunities, like for instance, NBA TV comes to us and they say, Hey, do you guys have someone who can go on our show? And I'm like, well, I have the most experience on my team doing stuff, but hell no, I'm not going to talk about it the NBA because I don't know what I'm talking about. Right. And so I then just kind of go down the line. Okay. This is clearly a high leverage situation because we're talking about the actual league and we're talking about a lot of eyeballs. So I'm going to get one of our better guys who, again, I say better, but I just mean more experienced than people who have already done this kind of stuff before and give them the opportunity to jump on that. So it's really just a balance of like what the impact of that specific task is uh, matching that with, you know, who the individual is. So you're going to put, you know, the high impact people uh, on the high impact things. And then the goal, everyone moves on at some point, but the goal is to then have people that are on the lower end build themselves up and get more and more comfortable. And then all of a sudden they can be in those positions in, you know, a year or two. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. It's an interesting angle. It's, we do so much of our, all of our content is, is primarily focused on YouTube and we're able to strip the audio and take clips and stuff like that. I do start to wonder sometimes though, some of the stuff that's, I don't want to say lo lesser performing, but just not as impactful on YouTube it might make sense to almost focus the energy on creating that for a platform like TikTok and see how it goes there rather than being like yeah. on top of the YouTube that's not working that well. Let's try to strip it and also put it on these other platforms, Rather, you know, like take it down that whole energy section that you're spending on this and put it all towards this and see what comes out of it. So, so it's interesting you bring that up because one of the big things that I, I push for and that we've done over the last few years is 
is uh, what we've just called audio to video. And so, I mean, it's it's like the the Dan Patrick show model, the Colin Coward. I mean, what you guys do, just filming the podcast, right? Mm-hmm. And so, and we've done that more and more, but then you get to a point eventually where you realize that you need to make platform specific content. And then yeah. that becomes more costly and that becomes more difficult. And that's, you know, we, we're definitely there and we're like figuring that out. That's, that's to your point, that's like the hardest thing to figure out is to know where to take the content that you're creating. Cause you want to kill multiple birds with one stone all the time with content, right? Like you want to be able to record a podcast, have it on video, put it on all RSS feeds slash put it up on YouTube, put it on Twitch, wherever the hell you want to put it on and have it there for people to discover it. But you also don't want to oversaturate it and, and, you know, make the quality worse because you're throwing it on platforms that it shouldn't necessarily be thrown on. Right. And so that's where it becomes a little bit tricky and I don't have the answer for it, but it becomes a little bit tricky to have this like platform specific content that is not just something that you can, you know, one piece of content that you're just throwing out on, on every platform. Yeah. It's really difficult because as new platforms emerge, they all have these different specific formats you need to be putting the different content into. And it's just like, YouTube is horizontal, but like horizontal doesn't play well on Instagram. TikTok right. is literally only vertical. So right. it becomes this whole other piece of investment you need to make just to make the content native to it. Is it going to work? Are we going to, you know, it, it becomes a crazy, crazy game, which is why I think we've been so obsessed with just investing into YouTube because we've found right. our, we found our leverage on YouTube and like we know the organic growth is there for us right now. So it makes sense for us to divest our energy into that. As soon as that stops working, maybe we take a different approach. But I do think this goes back to a point that I've been making on a lot of these episodes is like, you do have to find, if you're not a fan duel where you don't have the resources to be, to be everywhere and have people, you know, editing and producing for you, you have to find that leverage point And it comes back to where the eyeballs outnumber the actual content creators. So yes, it's an interesting dichotomy in the, in this space. And it's just like a, it's a crazy, crazy space to be in because the space is literally just built through content creators, right? It's not like the old days where there's products being created and you have these monopoly companies where yeah. the people that run the actual companies don't have faces to them. We're in a space where things get crazy because you know everybody, like you know the personalities of people and right. we're the ones shaping the space per se, right? Like audiences know us, they tell us what they want and we make the pivots that way. Um, right. Now you, you did you did bring up Clubhouse. So you completely ruined the fucking segue. We're going to get <laughs> it into a, it now. It would have been, per- been a perfect segue. By it would have. Right. I should have just cut you off right there and be like, no, we we're going to Clubhouse right now. But I, I've seen you be active on Clubhouse recently. I, I myself has, have been trying to be active on Clubhouse recently. It's in an interesting stage of where the platform is. It's gotten this like cr- crazy, crazy growth and hype over the last couple of months. And predictably so, because as more types of content like this pop out, people understand that they need to be on these platforms quickly. What I think Clubhouse it, Clubhouse is in a really interesting spot because it filled up with content creators trying to capture an audience before the audience was actually there. Mm-hmm. So it's a bunch of content creators talking to other content creators about how to create content. And I love that because yep. these are like my favorite types of conversations to have. So it's been a good a good space for me. But you've done some fantasy specific conversations, you know, when you're on guy, with guys like Matt Barry and stuff, they're going to have some built in audience there already. Like right. w- what's your takeaway from Clubhouse, the platform from like the audiences on there, maybe how you see yourself integrating it into your personal content going forward? Yeah. So I first off, I think that like for me personally, like my personal brand, a platform like Clubhouse is really perfect for me, like for me. Right. And I know that. So I'm trying to at least acclimate myself with it a little bit mm-hmm. uh, because I know that this face isn't really as good for, for TV. You know, I just, you just got to hear my not, voice. More than anything Look else. at those eyes. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, I mean, so I, I view clubhouse right now. It's almost like a, it's almost like you're at a conference and you're just stepping into different rooms at a conference. And you know, the problem with that is most of the time, most conferences, if any of you have been to a conference before, they aren't that engaging, you know, like panels and stuff like that. And so like that, I think is sort of the downside right now of how people are utilizing it is I think they're thinking of it, like you said, I think that what you said was perfect, that they're content creators basically talking to other content creators. And it's just like, what, what is this really like, like, what do you like? Sure. These people are getting something out of this, but you're not leveraging this platform really at all. And that's to my next point. I, I think that right now companies need to be aware of the opportunity cost in utilizing clubhouse now i'm not saying don't do clubhouse because we're we're definitely going after it right now at fanduel i mean i'm on it for a reason but i do think that 
you know, if you're going to, if you're going to create something and you're going to host a room and if it's, if, if you're going to like, let's say that you get in touch with someone who, you know, has a big audience in general, but might not have a big audience on clubhouse or anything. you know, that, that room that you have and you talk for an hour is only going to get 50 eyeballs in it or on it. Right. And, and people listening to it, you have to recognize that you would have been much better served talking to that person on YouTube where your audience already is. Right. And so there's this payoff. So I think that the way that I'm approaching it, at least, is I'm going on there when I don't have to prepare anything, when it's literally just my free time. Right? I'm exactly because, the same way. Yeah. And it's like if yeah. someone has a room set up for me, they're like, this is what we're talking about. We're going on at this time. There's already a built in audience. I'm like, yeah. sign me up. If I have to go out of right. my way to make that shit happen, different story. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I look, I, I think that anything early, like you're, you're waiting for the audience to be built and it's not necessarily on you to build that audience yet. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that like yesterday I hopped in on, on the swole cast with, with David kitchen and Davis Maddock. And I just, and, and Dan Bach was in there and, and I just talked to them about like, I mean, we talked about like fantasy football and stuff. And then they just started talking about like NFTs, which I'm very, very much a casual you know, player with that, with all of that. And I'm just like sitting there just like, randomly talking about it and just sort of shooting the shit. And that's the extent of, of where I'm taking it right now, where I think that people are still interested in that to some degree. And it's still a good like brand building exercise for you personally, because it's a different platform where you're able to connect with people. But I do think that from like a business standpoint, from a company standpoint, you know, you should be involved in some way, but I would not be like going ham because you're going ham in something that not only at, at the time, at this time, I believe there's not like the ability for these rooms to like stick around and for them to be like shareable and like that, like after the fact, you know, yeah. it's, it's very much just like, it's like a live stream that goes poof. Right. And so like that doesn't have that much value for a company. <clears throat> so I would much rather shift my focus to the things where, you know, you can benefit on. So like I said, if you can get someone who has like this great audience, like if you're talking to Matthew Barry or something like that, then you would probably want him on your YouTube channel and not on clubhouse just naturally. It just makes more sense. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting spot for that company. And you're seeing all these different audio spaces pop up, like Twitter spaces. I have that ability on my account. And I went on last week or yeah, last week for the first time. And it's obviously all these companies seeing the success that Clubhouse is having. They're like, oh, there's this drop in audio thing is, is here to stay. And we have to figure out a way to integrate it to our platform. Twitter spaces is basically shot out to my followers. So it's going to be way more personal brand yeah. related. There's no organic reach there. It's not like people that don't know me can really see that. Yeah. On Clubhouse though, there will be, I, I think they need to tweak things. Right now it seems Clubhouse is, is a little bit like clicky. Like whoever starts the rooms totally. are like gonna command the rooms and like that could be a little bit of a value loss for some people I would say. It also, when you first got on, it felt like a little bit spammy where it was like the six rooms that were on your feed were like, diamond emoji, diamond emoji, like learn how to yeah, get a million yeah. Instagram followers. I was like, are we really fucking doing this with this platform yeah, right. already? You know? So yeah. there's, there's some tweaking, there's some refining, but again, like you always have to be experimenting with these platforms. Cause as soon as organic reach becomes like a real thing, some, some people are going to, some people will, will break out on, on clubhouse and again, be set for life because they got in early and they did it right. Sure. And they paid attention to that stuff. So it's about finding that leverage point again. Clubhouse is one of the exciting platforms. It's kind of dropping out and just like NFTs, like NFTs are here to stay as per which project is the one that sustains a long-term growth. You don't know this audio right. shit is here to stay. We don't know which one's going to be popping off. So, you know, exactly. you get your hands in early, often in the right time, whatever, like that's where you need to be thinking again. Like you have a good mindset with this because you're a marketing guy first. You're like a content guy first. Like you're seeing the trends and then adapting that to the actual content you're doing where I think most people in our industry flip that and do it backwards where they're just passionate about the content and then are like, Oh fuck. Like, what do I do with the content now? And it should be the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I look, it's so early that like, like what we're seeing is obviously not even close <clears throat> to what it'll look like probably in six months even. Right. And, and so like, you know, we're, we're making statements based on what we're seeing right now. And I know that eventually there's going to be a point in time where like brands are gonna be able to monetize things and uh, monetize it in some way. And, mm -hmm. and we're going to be able to, come up with creative I, I, creative ways to do content. You know, the one thing that I'm a little bit concerned about in the short term is that everything is like the same yeah. right now within the space. Like there's not, no, it seems like no one's really, really thinking outside the box with it, which is fine because I think everyone's just trying to get their, you know, dip, they're just dipping their toes a little bit. But, you know, it's still, it's still just so early to, to know exactly where this thing's going to go. But I do think that, you know, as long as, the way I approach this kind of stuff in general is that like, 
if it doesn't take me a lot of time to do like a good example of this is like our, I do the start, a start sit show and on Fandle's YouTube channel every Sunday morning, right? It's at 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's at 12 o'clock, right? And it's rapid fire. My brain is fried by the end of it. It's a half hour long. And, but to me, it's only a half hour of my time because I'm not preparing Jack, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, I've, I've studied stuff all week long. It's just in the back of my head. So I'm just rapid firing, answering start sick questions for people. And it's only a half hour. Whereas if I'm creating a podcast, an episode of a podcast, that's hours and hours of work, right? So it all depends on the opportunity cost side of things. Like, you know, growing YouTube, of course, is very important just naturally, but hopping on a clubhouse for half hour isn't the end of the world, even if it's not really moving the needle that much, just because it's like a just in case type thing. Yeah, it's it's an interesting balance too, because you have to kind of look at your goals to depend on what you want to be doing. Like I, I've done a lot of clubhouse rooms already up to this point, And it's not from a place of like, Oh, I hope I can grow my status on there. It's more so like, I really enjoy the conversations yeah. that are happening on there that don't happen here uh, outside of me, like consciously yes. going out of my way to invite people like you on to talk about it where more people are getting interested in it. So clubhouse has already kind of revolved itself around the whole content creation thing. And I'm like, I kind of know what I'm talking about with this stuff. So it's cool that I can go in there talk about what I enjoy and also assert myself as sort of like a thought leader in the space when yeah. it comes to video creation. So it's kind of a perfect storm for me in particular. But like, like you said, there are not a lot of people being creative on the platform. But I think once you do start being the creative person on there, like it's good to have some sort of floor of an audience so that the creativity doesn't like go to die, right? You don't want to start exactly. two people and have something cool to share and then not be there. So Again, exactly. always goes back to just trying new things out, seeing what works, throwing it against the wall. If it sticks, go in on it. If not, not. All right. right. JJ, as one of the bigger names in the space, and, and this is, you know, kind of been something we've talked about for like the last hour or so, and why I was kind of intrigued by the fact that like you are working under a fan duel and not building your own personal brand or building your own brand personally with other personal brands under it. How do you find yourself not becoming kind of complacent with doing a lot of the things that you do weekly over and over again? Is it because they give you so much flexibility and like creativity within the team that like kind of keeps you reinvigorated and keeps you energized with this kind of stuff? Yeah, I think a lot of it is that I don't ever sweat job security. And so I don't really, from like a competitive, I, I think a lot of people are like competitive with their work because they are worried about because they want promotions and they want to look good, you know, within the the structure of that company. And I love Fanduel. I mean, I I do so much, you know, I, I love it. But I don't like sit there sweat. And I've never been this way. I don't sit there sweating my job because I hope that what I'm doing is coming from a place more of passion and something that I like to do. Right. So you know, to answer the question, it's like. Number one, first and foremost, like every single day I recognize that I'm just very lucky. Right. And I, I know like, yeah, hard work went into this and like, it, you know, I, I built my following and my readership for years and I just grinded it. No, like, fuck that. Like, I'm still lucky. Right. Like there's still like a luck factor that goes into this. And I recognize that to be able to do what I'm doing and, and to make a good living doing it, I, I'm in a great spot. And I have to always reckon, recognize that and be cognizant of that. And when you do recognize that it's always in the back of your head you know, it's impossible to be complacent almost. Like if, if someone's complacent because they are doing, you know, this because because they reached a level within an industry and they're cool with it. And, you know, I, first off, I don't think that's possible in the fantasy industry because things are changing way too much. And we see stagnant growth all the time with personalities who were around in 2005 and who haven't adapted, right? And so that's another thing. I know that I go back to like Matthew Berry, but like he's adapted well, right? Mm -hmm. Like all things considered, I, I mean, like he's adapted very well to what's gone on within the fantasy industry. And he's very much ingrained into what's going on and talking to people, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there's a number of examples of people who I'm sure that they're totally content with their, their job and their life and all of that kind of stuff. But they've also had stagnant growth. And you can see that based on their social media profiles and how things are growing, mm -hmm. you know, year to year. I mean, there's some guys where I'm checking, I'm like, you, how, how, how has this, like, how are you not even like remotely 
yeah. growing this audience. So I think it's a combination of like feeling lucky and feeling fortunate and that driving me combined with we have an industry that you can't really be complacent if you want to continue to grow. And I want to continue to grow because I'm passionate about what I'm doing. And so I, I think that that sort of combined just like, it, it's very hard for me to, I'm competitive as hell too. I mean, that's, that's important. Like yeah. I, I just want to, I want to do good shit and I want to, you know, I see other people like stuff that you do stuff that like what you're building right now, or someone comes out with like this really awesome study that they did on some fantasy football related topic. Like I, that like gets me going, right? Like I'm like, I sit there, I'm like, well, like they're doing this thing and they're getting recognized for it, which props to them. I'm glad they're getting recognized for it, but like, I want to start doing cool stuff too. And, you know, I'll get into these funks where like for three or four months, like, I feel like it's just the same thing over and over again. But then like, I see something that like motivates me like that. And that like gets me going. And maybe the maybe the common denominator here is just like passion for what we're doing. But I think a lot of people can say they're just passionate, right? Like they like 90 million people are passionate about fantasy football, mm -hmm. right? I, I think that it's more so this like combination of everything that I've got what I've got right now and I don't want to lose that. And I want to continue to grow that. And then on top of that, you know, I, I I just get that sort of fire under me whenever I see other people doing some good stuff. Yeah, dude, that's why... I think I even do this series in the first place. It's because one, I get to learn from people who have done things that I've done already and like teach me and get my inspiration from it. I'm the same exact way. Like when I see people succeed, it gets me going and not in like a hate, a hateful way. It's like, oh, yeah. okay. Like I know that person. Like if they could pull that shit off, I could think of something that yes. is also like equally creative and equally inspiring and equally, you know, whatever it is. Like my work ethic is there. So as long as I, put some time down to it and think about it. I'm like, oh, these kids are working fucking hard. Like I, I see what they're doing. You know, like if I want to yeah. stay where I'm at, I need to be at that level, if not above that. And that's, a, that's the kind of shit that keeps me going too. And you see it all around the industry. There was just so many people that, that work really, 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 really hard. And yeah, it's just like, it's a cool, it's a cool space to be in. Cause so many people are passionate about it. Do you, do you ever like think about making content outside of specific to like football or fantasy football related? Not really. I've thought about it like randomly, but not, I mean, not really. I mean, I, I think that like, like I could see a world where like, maybe I would have been interested in going into like gaming because I do some gaming and stuff like that, but like, and doing like the Twitch thing, but not really. I mean, like, I don't think I would have ever written and had, had like writing be, which I, again, it's not really a big part of my job anymore because I try to evolve and change with the mm -hmm. times and stuff. But, you know, I never thought in a world that, my job would be centered around writing. Not that I ever thought that I couldn't write, but it was never like, I mean, I went to school for marketing, right? Mm -hmm. Like I was never like, didn't take creative writing classes, didn't do, I just learned. And like, I knew that I have like a creative way of thinking about things and viewing the world. But, you know, I never thought that my outlet would then end up being, you know, through the written word. So I think that the only reason why it is, is because I found something that, I truly am passionate about. And that's, that's the thing that like is going to drive me at the end of the day is the fact that I just, I love fantasy football. And you know what, when I first wrote my ebook, you know, I left the one job and then I started writing the ebook and then I was at this other job. I can't even tell you how many weird ass looks I got when I told them that I was writing an ebook on fantasy football. And I have, I have enough, like I got anxiety. I've had anxiety issues, you know, throughout my life and stuff like that, which I know a lot of people do, you know, it's not like I was like, it was like insane or anything, but I cared and you're in your twenties. I was in my twenties too. Right. And not, not that I'm like this old dude now, although I feel old sometimes whenever I go on these shows, <laughs> but like, like, you know, like I'm, I'm in my twenties and perception matters, right? Like the, like the way that someone reacts to something that you say or something that you do, you know, I, I think it's human nature to just like internalize that in some way. Mm -hmm. And so when I would tell them that I was like, like I would see them at a happy hour or something. I would tell them like, yeah, I'm working on this ebook, but I'm also doing some other marketing stuff, this other company. And they're like, oh, what's the ebook on? I'm like, oh, it's a fantasy football ebook. And they would just be like, cool. Like, that's awesome. That's really, really cool. And, and like, you know, people would like talk shit on it almost. And the only re I, I feel like if that was any other topic, any other thing, I probably would have stopped. But I just really, really love this thing. And I hope that it comes out in my content. I hope it comes out in you know, me, so it turns some people off because they feel like I'm like screaming at them when I'm doing the late round podcast. <laughs> but like, 
it's really just coming from a place of like, I love this shit and I don't want to let this shit go. And that's, what's going to drive me to constantly evolve. And like, to your question, you just asked, like, you know, the stuff that I do is very data driven, right? And the analysis I do is data driven in order to not be a grandpa in that space and to not have people lapping you, you have, you're, you're forced to evolve. Like if you're just like watching film and that's like what you do and you know, you give your takes on players that way in a more subjective way and you're good at it, that's great, but you don't have to necessarily evolve that way of, of looking at things because the other people that you're competing with are also doing the same thing by just watching these guys and saying things about what they're seeing. Whereas Mm -hmm. new software is coming out, you know, things are more accessible for, from a numbers driven standpoint and people are learning different coding languages and like, that's the kind of stuff that like I can't fall behind because people are looking at me as someone who is a you know I don't I don't think I'm the best like data analyst in the world I think I'm a good data communicator that's the way that I always sort of like frame it but like that's really what I know that I'm like talking circles of, uh, you're good to bro. Answer the Keep, question run it run it let's go but, but like like that to me is like a huge huge driving force like you mentioned all you know you seeing all these other people succeed and stuff and you know the fantasy space in general is one where like like if you do good content, you're going to number one, be found and you're, there's, there's room for it. There's always room for it. And, and I think that, that people don't always realize that they're not internally, you know, they're not, they're not looking at themselves if they're being rejected and stuff. They're, they're more so, you know, just thinking that there's like not, there's too much content out there in fantasy, but I don't think that's the case. I think that you got to make sure that what you're creating is good. And so as a result of that, you get this community of people where we're rooting for each other right? Like we just had the FSWA awards. And when I won the late round, when the late round podcast won best podcast, all three of the fantasy footballers DM me instantly. And like, it was like, they, like they wanted me to win more than they want to win themselves, partially because they have 150 effing awards already. But it's just one of those things where like, you know, it's just, it's cool. And that's what really gets you going and motivates you and just keeps you, keeps you running because you got to constantly evolve, but you're constantly evolving in a space that's awesome. And it's just, you, you should be passionate about it. Yeah. And, and going back to something you did say, like how it felt weird, you know, talking to people about the ebook and fantasy football, like I can relate to that on a lot of levels. Like when I start, I started a YouTube channel about fantasy football, like five or six years ago, that was weird at the time. It was like, why are you talking into a camera about fantasy football? I just believed so strongly in like in myself and what I was doing. I was like, this is, this will work. You know, like I just believed in what it was and everything that people do that's new is going to be looked at as as very weird but as long as you believe in it like i'm sure there's a reason why you inherently believe in it and it'll probably work out for the better i think as content creators like you just you know when you put yourself out there you make yourself very vulnerable and that's the uncomfortable feeling like you're gonna get judged but also understand that anybody who's ever started anything and anyone who's ever put themselves out there feels the same way like we're not just because me and jj are super comfortable doing it now on podcasts on video or whatever does not mean that that was always the case does not mean that we still don't get uncomfortable with this shit like everybody goes through the ringer with this stuff so when you're starting out you're feeling uncomfortable just know that it's wildly wild it would be it would be weirder if you didn't feel that way yeah the one thing i would say too again i'm i mean i'm not i'm 33 so i'm not like this like you know yeah well, this the, the generation changed really quickly. So the ebook to me, like, wasn't a thing. I'm, I'm 28. Yeah. So I'm only five years younger right. than you, but YouTube was like my thing. And then like, someone's exactly. going to be, there's going to be a 35 year old guy. That's like, I don't want to get on TikTok because people are going to look at me weird five years from now right. when, when he would have had 600,000 followers and been set for life, like wish he would have done that. Yeah. But if I, if there was one thing that I wish I would have really, really realized when I started doing this stuff is that it goes back to that perception thing because it goes into like on Twitter, obviously you're going to get trolls, you're going to get hate, all of that. And when I was 25 years old starting this out and like doing this as my job, there's no chance in hell I handled trolls the way that I do now, right? Mm -hmm. Part of that's natural maturity and just like you find yourself in your early 20s a little bit and like you're, you like know who you are then and then you can handle things a certain way. But part of it is like the perception thing. You feel like you always have to defend yourself. Like you, you have this feeling, this reaction of like, oh, you started a, a YouTube channel about fantasy football and then you come back to them like, yeah, but I made X dollars this year. And like, you gotta like, but like, you gotta just be cool with it. You just gotta be like, I don't care. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter enough. Like whatever you think, it doesn't matter. Cause I know that I'm satisfied with my job. I'm making good money. I, I love the people I work with. 
love the company I work for. I'm living, I'm quite literally like living my dream. And so if I go on Instagram and I post a picture of my FSWA awards because I'm proud of them and someone's like, you know, like it's like, it's almost like this, like, oh, that's cute sort of thing. Like, it's like, no, like there's a lot of people competing for this these things. It's fucking just, cool. It is cute. Yeah. It is fucking like, cute. Yeah. Like, you don't, just because you don't understand how big this industry is, doesn't mean that this industry isn't massive and competitive. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you gotta, you gotta find that motivation within yourself to not care about what those people think. And it's not easy, especially from someone like me who cares about that kind of stuff. Cause I think it's, it's human nature to care about that kind of stuff and to care about perception. And you get that anxiety as a result of that. But with time, it just gets easier and easier. I mean, I think that's why like old people are, are so, they appear so rude. It's because they just don't, they don't care. Right. Yeah. Like, like they've been through so much stuff. It's like, why would they, why would they care about the way that this person thinks about this one topic? They know they're set in their ways for a reason. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I just think that like, just, just not worrying so much about that perception and what you're working on and what you're doing and just going after it is just so un unbelievably important. There we go. We will drops. We will drops the mics right there. Both of them that will conclude this episode. So JJ, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on, man. This was a, a fantastic conversation. I'm pretty sure the audience will love this as, as you know, we've been blessed with a lot of really, really good guests and you just line them up and knock them down to continue the streak on here. So why don't we tell them we kind of preface with what was going on, but if there's anything that you're working on right now that you're particularly proud of or, or something that you want to throw, throw their way the floor is yours. Yeah. You know, the late round podcast is like, again, my baby, it's the thing I'm working on the most, but like number fire we're doing, we do all sports too. We got March madness coming up and, and, uh, number fire has been absolutely slaying with tur like the tournament over the last like five or six years. It's amazing. So definitely check that out over on number fire, but the late round podcast is, you know, the thing that I always got to pimp a little bit whenever I sign off. Well, con consider it pimped all the links, his social, everything we mentioned in the episode will be linked. First thing in the description down below. Thank you all for joining us. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed, and we'll see you next Monday for next week's episode. Peace. Ah!